Hello, my dear friends. Today we will read the memoirs of the Japanese commander of the artillery platoon of 150mm guns, Lieutenant Yoshitaki Kunio. It is exactly his gun, a 150mm Type 96, that remains to this day on the hillside of Height 165. To this day, a huge amount of abandoned Japanese military equipment is still on the island as a memory of the war. He describes in his memoirs the Battle of Shumshu, which was fought on August 18, 1945, between the Red Army and Japanese Army. The Soviet Union's invasion of Shumshu Island in the Kuril Islands was the first stage of the Red Army's invasion of the Kuril Islands in August to September 1945 during World War II. It was fought between August 18th and 23rd, 1945, and it was the only major battle of the Soviet campaign in the Kuril Islands, and one of the last battles of the war. The operation on the island of Shumshu was the only battle of the Soviet-Japanese War during which the Soviet forces suffered more casualties in killed and wounded than did the Japanese. But before we begin, I would like to thank Call of War, the sponsor of this video. Call of War is a free online PvP strategy game about World War II. You have to build your cities, defend and expand your country, manage your resources, and trade with other rulers. Also, master spy missions, create a powerful army, and a strong alliance with other players to prepare for the final confrontation. Call of War is cross-platform, so you can compete with your friends on both PC and mobile under the same account to find out who the real conqueror is. Subtle Diplomacy or Brute Force? Miracle Weapon or Weapon of Mass Destruction? The choice is yours! Follow the link in the description of the video and you will receive an exclusive gift, 13,000 gold and one month of premium subscription for free. Offer available for 30 days only, so hurry up! Now, let's begin. I am pretty far from being a creative writer. I cannot honestly say that I possess an exquisite mastery of words but I have written notes about the battles of the long-gone past, which are dedicated to my combat comrades, with whom we have fought defensive battles together for many years in the North, and who sacrificed their lives in the last brutal battles in the defense of Shumshu Island, and whose ashes, left on Soviet ground, I still mourn. Following the Imperial rescript on August 15th declaring the end of the war, our artillery platoon was ordered by the command to destroy the artillery tables. 150mm field guns were considered secret weapons, and other secret documentation. I kept the artillery fire data records regarding the fire on the Soviet artillery positions at Cape Lopatka in my possession. We were ordered to leave the ammunition and observation equipment in their places. We never expected that a Soviet offensive was coming. At about midnight on August 18th, we received an alarming message from the observers. We rushed out of the barracks and heard the sounds of artillery cannonade coming from Cape Lopatka. It was clear that the Soviet artillery had opened fire, and the troops were put on alert. After a few minutes, the Murakami Battalion, 282nd Separate Infantry Battalion, gave the following order. The Soviet army is firing artillery on the island of Shumshu. It is expected that the landing force will be landed in the area of the Kodamari coast. The 150mm guns units on Mount Siri should immediately fire in return. All units were ordered to assemble. The personnel were informed that we had been attacked by Soviet troops. As it was decided earlier, our platoon was to overwhelm the enemy artillery at Cape Lopatka. The strength ratio is one of our guns to four enemy guns. Notwithstanding this ratio, we must demonstrate the best training skills, demonstrate the entire power of the artillery of the Imperial ground forces. The personnel have orders to prepare 10 subcaliber and 10 armor-piercing shells. Here, probably there are problems with the translation of military terminology. Most likely it means high explosive firing. There was nothing to be seen at this point due to the thick fog. At 0.30 a.m., there were reports from the observation unit, from the communications unit, and from the artillery positions about readiness for battle. Our artillery platoon was completely ready. Waiting for the order to fire, I attempted by telephone to contact the 2nd Artillery Regiment headquarters in Kashiwabara. Headquarters Commander Lt. Col. Sakaguchi Motu, and the Artillery Division Headquarters, Division Commander Capt. Okazaki Sakuji, to obtain further instructions. But due to the congested lines, it was impossible to communicate with the headquarters. It seemed that the infantry units were getting into the battle. The artillery cannonade coming from the direction of Cape Kokutan and Kotamari was growing stronger. 
According to the fact that the enemy's heavy artillery on Cape Lopatka was transferring its fire closer to our positions, the enemy's landing operation seemed to be successful. At 1.30 a.m., the Murakami Battalion requested 150mm guns for fire support, but communication with the 2nd Artillery Regiment headquarters was still failing. I came to realize that we could not delay it any longer, or otherwise the enemy would overwhelm us and we would be unable to support our troops, so I made my own decision to open fire. We made contact with the command post of Murakami's battalion and reported our decision to open fire. Meanwhile, we reported that direct fire support for the infantry will be impossible because the artillery tables were previously destroyed by order, so there is a risk of damaging our own troops with fire. In this regard, we are only able to return fire on the enemy's heavy artillery at Cape Lopatka. The Murakami Battalion headquarters accepted our agreement. At 2 a.m., the enemy's shells began to hit our positions. I approached the observation post, but I could not see further than 100 meters from the positions because of the thick fog, which was still there. Then I said to Senior Sergeant Yoshimura, an observation and liaison unit, If possible, track the hitting of our shells. I will return to the positions and I rushed to the guns. Target! The enemy heavy artillery on Cape Lopatka! Azimuth! I cannot remember exactly. With sub-caliber. Probably a high explosive. Instant action fuse! Charge number one! Rapid fire! 15,600! I recall the first shot's range precisely. The shell entered the breech of the gun with a metallic clang. We put in three gunpowder packets and closed the breech. The gun was loaded. The barrel was slowly changing the angle of elevation. Just as the gunner, Senior Sergeant Moore, reported that the gun was ready, I gave him the signal. The thunder of the gun heard all over the place, and the ground trembled beneath my feet. It was like a thicket of crowberry had been pinned to the ground. 16,000! Another one! Three to the left! 15,800! Next! With a rapid fire on the asbestos tube of the gun breech there was a flame, the third number of the gun crew yelled, Water! Water! Hurry up! Pour water on it! The loader rushed out to find water. After cooling the tube, we opened fire again. How long was this going on? We noticed that the enemy's heavy guns firing became less intense, perhaps as a result of our fire. At 4 a.m., the fog was gradually thinning, and we noticed a column of fire rising into the sky at the enemy positions. And a series of bursts was heard. It was obvious that we had hit an ammunition depot. The observation post also reported that a fire had broken out at the enemy positions. From that moment, the artillery firing from the enemy ceased. The Soviet artillery was overwhelmed. With the ratio of guns 1 to 4 in the enemy's favor, this was our total triumph. When these results were confirmed by the observation post, our combat spirit was unusually high. To our good fortune, Yamashita, the kitchen duty officer, came to bring us some lovingly prepared rice cakes. They were even garnished with radishes. Together, we all raised a toast to victory and began to eat. It was so delicious that I cannot put it into words. Gradually, everyone's smiles returned, and the fight was soon forgotten. But then, we again moved to our positions and opened fire on the enemy's vessels in the area of the lighthouse on Cape Lopatka. The light gradually grew brighter. The range of vision increased to two to 3,000 meters, but we could not see the hit of shells. The bullets were flying above our heads from time to time. We have a feeling that the enemy infantry is approaching the slopes of Mount Siri. For the purpose of strengthening the defense, we engaged an additional three soldiers from a neighboring infantry unit and assigned them to stay close to the gun positions. At 6 a.m., our gun positions came under a heavy enemy mortar fire from the top of the mountain. We kept returning fire, and during this artillery firefight, Yamashita was seriously wounded by a mine fragment. We suddenly were informed that enemy infantry units had advanced in the direction of Daikandai, to our forward positions on the opposite bank of the Tiyokigawa River. We urgently changed the direction of the fire attack, opened direct fire at a distance of 500 meters, though after two rounds, we did not notice any shell bursts. It was obvious that the shells had failed to reach the target. We changed the direction to the previous one, to Cape Lopatka, and opened the storm fire. Then we found out that the enemy had appeared at Takidahama. We slightly reduced the firing distance and continued the artillery fire. Tragically, at this moment, Nakazi and Fujita were seriously wounded and faced their last hour in the gun position with agony. Both of them got through wounds in the head. In front of our eyes, our battle comrades, who were scornful of enemy shells, fell to a heroic death. The feeling of rage was beyond limit. Those damned enemies! 
we opened more hard fire in retaliation for our dead comrades. Fortunately, the enemy, not knowing our exact position, did not go in bayonet attack, but conducted small arms fire from the top of the mountain. All of a sudden, the interrupted screw cracked. Was it because of a hit by an enemy bullet? We tried to fix the problem, but to no avail. It was impossible to keep firing the gun. The communication with the observation post was broken. We opened fire with the available rifles and pistols. We all had still a bayonet and a broadsword, but I doubt if we could use them to conduct the battle until victory. A feeling of uncertainty gradually emerged. Now we make our own decision to move back from the gun positions. At 9.30 a.m., the order to move back was given. It was not because we wanted to survive, but because it was necessary to save our strength for the next battles. We destroyed the gun sites, destroyed the means of communication. We did it in silence, not looking at each other in the eyes. We bowed in silence to our fallen comrades and to the abandoned, destroyed guns. Then, cautiously, to not provoke enemy fire, began to go down the slopes of the mountain. We came across the survivors of a mortar battery that was not far from our position and helped the wounded. For a long time, these brave soldiers also conducted a heavy battle, but the power was running out. At 10 a.m., Sergeant Major Morey and someone else, I don't remember his surname, headed back to the observation post to check once again to see if anyone was still alive. The command was entrusted to Corporal Tabuchi. He ordered to join the second platoon of our battery. The headquarters of the 1st Artillery Division was deployed on the plateau and prepare for a new battle. And the commander of the mortar platoon was ordered to choose the moment and give orders to move out. We found 15 men under Yoshimura's command at the observation post. We checked the state of the soldiers, then went to the command post located in the caves to the battalion commander Murakami. We reported to him the present situation. We reported about the intention to destroy the guns completely, which were useless for firing, but he refused this plan. At 15 p.m., the second wave of the offensive began. The soldiers at the observation post opened rifle fire through holes in the shelter. Destroyed more than a dozen enemy soldiers, but the strength of such fire was insignificant. There was a threat that the enemy, having fought with the infantry and artillery units, would push us into the caves and surround us. Obviously, the enemy intended to push us into the caves and exhaust us with a long battle. It made me curious to see how long the fight would last. We chewed on the pathetic remnants of breadcrumbs, all ready to die. Many of us were in a half-sleep. It was not clear whether they were alive or dead. Just the flame of the candle fluttered faintly. I had a short nap, and when I woke up, the daylight was already breaking in the cave. It was the 19th of the month. On this day, the enemy attacked again, but not so actively. By joint efforts, our infantrymen and artillerymen beat back the enemy's attack. After that, the enemy did not resume the attack. After that, the commander ordered all the officers to gather for a meeting. I was also present at it. The meeting ended with the decision to conduct an active offensive. The deputy commander, Imai, reported to the brigade by radio communication about the plan to breakthrough and the destruction of scramble tables. We determined the unit that would head the breakthrough and completed the positioning of all forces and means. We noticed the parliamentaries of the enemy moving to the hill on the front line. We ceased all actions in our disposition and started to observe the situation. The scramble tables had already been destroyed and it was impossible to observe the situation. As the parliamentaries were noticed, there was no way to take the offensive. As long as we were in this state of uncertainty, it gradually became dark and the resumption of the breakthrough seemed impossible. There were not enough supplies. There was no water at all. If this situation will continue, we would finally lose our combat capability. The only thing left to do is wait for death. Battalion Commander Murakami has decided, leave the caves, join with the neighboring units, and retake Mount Siri. The same unit that was assigned to the vanguard earlier will lead the breakthrough. It was ordered to give grenades to seriously wounded men, giving them the opportunity to determine their own fate. Fortunately, there were no such men in our platoon. In case of encounter with our soldiers, the password is loyalty. The answer is courage. Our platoon was assigned Cape Murakami as the first area of concentration, where the second battery of 100mm guns of the 2nd Artillery Division was located. Depending on the situation, if it was not possible to concentrate, then we had to determine a withdrawal plan with the 2nd platoon of our battery. At 10 p.m., we started to leave. I led the column, with Mori and Obata in the middle and Yoshimura as the last. We pushed forward through thick bushes and rhododendrons. 
We had set up our positions here exactly two years ago, and we knew the area perfectly well, like the backyard of our own house. But there was darkness. The enemy obviously observed our withdrawal and opened fire. The formation of our column was broken. Communication with the column was interrupted. The men in the tail of the column could hear only gunshots. We waited for a while in the swamp. There were only three people next to me. The rest of the fighters came out by themselves, and later we all managed to get together again. At hard moments, there was nothing left but to trust in the higher power, praying for a successful outcome of the whole platoon. This way we moved forward, stopping for a while to wait for the trailing men to pull up. And now we could see barely distinguishable outlines of the barracks of the second battery of 100mm guns. The tears came to my eyes. The second battery in full came out, and its soldiers met us. We were afraid that the battery had died totally on the slopes of Mount Siri. The soldiers greeted each other cheerfully with strong hugs and handshakes. Our platoon gathered gradually. Everyone was safe and sound. All of us were happy to be alive. The only ones missing were Obata and Yokoyama. I was told that both of them were just in the area from where the firing was coming from. They were later confirmed dead. As we still had hope that they would come out, as well as other men of the gun crews, we, along with two platoons of the 5th Battery, loaded onto vehicles and headed for the second area of concentration. Tabuti and his men safely joined up with the 3rd platoon. We met them safe and sound. At the same time, however, the destiny of Obata and Yokoyama was a cause for concern. As ordered, a few men of the gun crews remained. The rest of the platoon was attached to the headquarters. They went under the command of the second platoon commander of the 5th Battery, Saruma, directly. After arriving on Paramushir Island, we reported to the battery commander and unit commanders the situation. I was assigned again as platoon commander. It was quiet nights on the Kuril Islands. There was no turmoil. The faces of the dead, Nakazi, Yokoyama, are in my mind. God only knows when it will end. Writing these words, I pray, the countless flowers of Shumshu, the old plum trees that covered the battlefields on the slopes of the mountains, are you still blooming in memory of the fallen comrades in arms? Call of War is a free online PvP strategy game about World War II. Choose your own unique strategy, engage in epic battles, and take over the world. You can receive an exclusive gift. For this, click on the link in the description and get 13,000 gold and one month of premium subscription for free. Offer available for 30 days only. Don't waste time. Click on the link in the description, choose your country, and pave your way to victory.